¿Estás viendo? Tú sí puedes ser. Sí puedes ser, me cago en la puta, pero yo no veo ahí un avión. Sí puede ser perfectamente, hombre. No, es un avión fuga. ¿Qué vas a hacer? Como, como que no tiene forma el avión. Pues, pues tío, hay aviones y nada y todo flipado. Ah, pues eso sí, que no hay aviones ni nada, pero alas no tiene, tío. Y en negro, y alas tiene blanco. Uh, ¡Mira la luna! ¡Ay! Ah, sí, 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 sí. Me ha partido el cuello, tío. Mira, 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 mira. Está haciendo de lado, está de lado, ahora sí se le ha puesto alas. Qué espectáculo de Chen Trails. Pero eso, eso, eso puede que no sea un avión, tío, que sea un dron o algo, ¿sabes? Mira la curva que está haciendo el, el de... <coughs> yo lo que sé que vuelo a una altitud flipante. Pero flipante. Yo me iba de aquí, yo me iba de este pueblo, Francis. Si tú ríes, ¿eh? ¿Tú te crees que esto puede ser bueno y no está cayendo directamente encima, tío? There he goes, blasting. There he is, shooting out his stuff. Poof. Sorry about that. You could see him just shooting spurts of it out. Look at this dirty bastard. What a time to come out and catch a wing sprayer. Oh, look at this guy. Go on, mate. Do your best. Oh, look at that. Fucking rainbow trail, look. You dirty little fucker. Well, well, well talk about being in the right place at the right time fucking bang on with this
tosser. And what a fucking tosser. Look at that. The full wingspan. That ain't coming out of fucking engines. That's coming out of the wings. And he's just stopped. What the fuck is going on? Look at this geezer. I hope this is fucking focused. <laughs> All right, another amazing update from Dr. Kirkendall here. Right now I'm actually seeing five simultaneous jets fly over the uh, restaurant here at High Key here in Austin, Texas. I have never seen anything like this. This is frustrating, and I got to tell you, if this doesn't make you think that there's something wrong, what's going on here, then we've got, we've got a serious communication problem here, ladies and gentlemen. We need to start taking a look up what's going on with our skies, and start really talking about the real issues because this this is I've never seen anything quite like this absolutely unbelievable and I just wanted to give you a, radio, a video update today thank you
juste, il y a certaines personnes qui pensent que, que ces épandages ont lieu actuellement. Et qui... Ah, ça, je ne suis pas au courant. Non. Quelqu'un est au courant des, des euh, épandages de... Ben de... De ces trois métaux lourds, barium, aluminium et... Barium, strontium, aluminium et... Strontium. Et strontium. Euh, qui auraient pour effet d'augmenter de, de, la... De, de refroidir la terre. Ben de, comme le soufre, oui. mais avec un effet quatre fois plus fort. Ah oui. Et, euh, et par contre, il ben, y a un film qui, qui se trouve sur Internet et qui se trouve... Euh, et qui s'appelle euh, « What in the world are the spray ?» euh, Et dedans, c'est pas mal de gens qui font des recherches pour voir... Euh, ils arrivent à mettre en évidence que l'aluminium et le barium euh, sont, se trouvent en très grande quantité dans les espaces naturels, de façon euh, anormale. Ah. Écoutez, je vais essayer de manquer là, je ne suis pas au courant. Voilà, je ne voudrais pas jouer le censeur, mais nous allons... Euh... Merci. Arrêtez les questions pour laisser M. Rive se reposer. More recently in the news, an issue of geoengineering has, has uh, come up and had a question about specifically stratosphere aerosol geoengineering, also called chemtrails. Uh, we see those on a regular basis here in California. Would you care to comment on that? We, we can't think that these chemicals that they create in aerosol cans and in our you know, ingredients we put on, even on our skin and food that we're putting in us can be healthy for us. Why there's an increase when we have such great medical science today, why is there an increase of flus, an increase of other diseases that, that hadn't been here before? Why are people you know, getting sickly all the time and, and, with the, and with the chemtrails. You know, I really just didn't know what they were. And then one day I was actually at a Ron Paul uh, protest and I was standing with a military veteran. He was a very decorated military veteran, older gentleman. And he said, well, we sure have some chemtrails today. And I looked at him. I said, what do you mean we have chemtrails? He goes, look up in the sky. I go, all oh, those lines. I said, I was wondering what they are. He goes, I worked in the military. And he said, young lady, I worked for the people that are putting that in the sky. Now, I'm not going to argue with a decorated military, you know, you know, war veteran here. So I asked him a few questions and he said, young lady, go home and do your research and just know that this is not healthy for you. I, I, I don't know why. Why? These are questions that you and I, we the people, need to be asking. Why? Is there something malicious that is happening? Or is it benign? I mean, what? But why aren't we having any answers and why aren't people talking about it? Obviously, we can't look up in the sky and see these chalk, you know, like looking lines. Some days they're there, some days the sky is blue. We can't keep overlooking that. We have to start asking questions. So what would you say to those scientists that say those are just normal contrails? I, it was about a month ago, two months ago, I was out in the desert and the sky in the morning was clear blue, clear blue. And later in the day I was driving to some campaign event. All of a sudden I see a, a plane, small plane, uh, up in the sky and you could see the trails. All of a sudden I see another one. And you just see these trails, these lines for miles, and they were zigzagging in the sky. I saw it with my own eyes, so I, that's not weather. I, I've seen big, huge propelled jets that don't leave that in the sky. So, I, I'm, again, I, 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 I don't know. But you, uh, scientists, 
scientists, the scientific community, first of all, I mean, sometimes there's, there's research that's being paid by someone. Well, who's paying them to do the research? You have sponsors. Well, who's sponsoring it? And also science, that's why it's called science. It's not perfect. It's just like with global warming. You had scientists that came out that said, well, our Earth is warming, and we have global warming, and we need to stop green emissions into the sky and then you have other scientists that came out and said no you're wrong that's false I, actually our earth has been cooling so that's science so uh, you know we what we need is we need answers we need to know what company what who 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 are driving the planes who is ordering the planes I don't know again I'm not an expert but we certainly should be asking questions You know, the environmentalists that are out there, how come they're not addressing that? Well, of course, because the special interests, they, the globalists, that's who that pays them their pockets to go out and be the activists that they claim to be. So what we need to do is we need to expose that and we need to join and make an environmental act, a real environmental act that prevents them from penetrating the air. Which Chemtrails. And uh, chemtrails, by the way, barium salts are in chemtrails. They are 10,000 times more toxic to your nervous system than lead. They contain mycobacteria, viruses, Pseudomonas florensis, bacteria, human plasma. Hmm, wonder what human plasma is doing in chemtrails. And this is not by conjecture. I did a lot of research before I'd ever say this. But these chemtrails are nasty. And there's three reasons for chemtrails. The first is they, and I talked to my NSA buddies at Fort Carson, Peterson Air Force Base in Buckley, where I was actually their doctor taking care of the pilots flying and spraying the chemtrails. So I know it's real. If anybody says it's not real, they're full of it. Okay, because I'm a whistleblower on the inside. It's not open for discussion. And my NSA buddies told me, 95% of them told me, they were up there trying to spray to reflect the sun out to stop global warming. So most of them are dumb enough to believe that garbage. <laughs> All right, first off, I just want to, I know everyone else has said it, but I really appreciate everybody that has come out here today. It's not just showing up and supporting an event, it's actually listening to those of us who here are, are here to share a message. So as it was presented to you, I'm here to speak to you about geoengineering. First thing I want to ask you is, who doesn't believe it exists? Anybody here on the fence? Okay. Well, hopefully when you leave here today, you don't just believe it. You share the information that I'm going to share with you, and you get more people on board to stop this ethical crime, unethical crime. I want to show you a video clip because the first thing people ask me about geoengineering is, who are these people? Who are the people that are, you know, kind of pushing the button to get this thing going? One of them, his name is David Keith, and David Keith has been low in the radar for a while, but he has written a book about climate engineering that has basically done more for the truth movement of this than anything. Because he is the frontline person that is the number one advocate for geoengineering. The chemtrails are being used in conjunction with heart by spraying metal oxides into the air above enemy skies, then directing ELF waves from heart to heat those metal oxides. The temperature of the sky is raised to more than 100 degrees Fahrenheit preventing the accumulation of water vapor that would otherwise form clouds and produce rainfall. So I wanted you to see that video because I wanted you to have a face for somebody who's actually out there violating the ethics of their job to promote geoengineering. I'm going to talk about geoengineering, but I want to share a story with you. Every time I'm asked to speak, I, I'm a, I public speak for a living. Um, I'll go into that, but I don't get nervous to speak to you. 
What I get nervous about is not getting emotional telling you my story. Because in 2002, shortly after 9-11, like a lot of military veterans, I raised my right hand and I took an oath to the Constitution to hopefully do something meaningful with my life, you know, 19 years old, unsure what I wanted to do. So I enlisted in the U.S. Air Force. My job in the U.S. Air Force was working in bioenvironmental engineering. So what bioenvironmental engineering is in the Air Force is equivalent to that of the OSHA and the EPA, if you're familiar with that. So we were an embedded liaison to make sure that we were tracking all of the aspects and impacts of the military, meaning what is the military doing and how is it impacting the environment because we were accountable for that. Being government, we did not get any special treatment. We just couldn't be fined being another federal agency. EPA can't, but not OSHA. So from the health side, it was knowing what you do in the Air Force. What does your job entail that is hazardous to your health? And I'm going to give you an example. Let's say that you were an aircraft painter. You were a mechanic. My job would go out to make sure I knew everything that you did, what you were exposed to, and how to mitigate and engineer out those hazards. Because we needed to, one, it, it's your legal right to be working in a safe and healthful work environment. So throughout nine years, I worked as an industrial hygienist and an environmental specialist. One of, actually, there's two bases I was at that are called air logistics centers. What does that mean? It's not like a fighter wing, you know, it's not really fun and amazing. What they did is they took aircraft that around every 10 to 15 years, they were required to be dismantled down to the last screw. So that meant every single industrial process you can think about, checking the metal integrity, making sure everything's good to go, or sometimes overhauling equipment. Part of my job in tracking the health hazards was to look at any time someone wanted to buy a chemical, any type of chemical. It was ordered through a system, and in that system, I had to go in there and say, you know, the country we're in, we're not allowed to use this. We need to substitute it out with something a little less hazardous while also maintaining the integrity for a technical order, meaning for that process it says you must use, you know, xylene or toluene to do this process. Well, I have to kind of fast forward. I want to say around 2006, I started kind of opening my eyes to how the military wasn't really what I thought it was. And people approached me knowing what I did for a living and said, have you ever heard of chemtrails? Well, I hadn't. And that sparked my interest. So I went online and I looked at chemtrails. I saw a lot of, you know, debunking, a lot of sites that were just kind of calling it a conspiracy theory. And I thought, well, geez, this is what I do for a living. Preventive health, making sure that people are not getting sick, especially in the workplace, and by things that we're doing that can affect, you know, human health and the environment. To summarize it, in an attempt to debunk this conspiracy theory as I thought it was, I didn't debunk it. It literally changed my life. Um, like I said, this is hard for me because it's not easy standing here and telling my story. One day I was going through that computer system, which if you want to look it up, it's called an Air Force Form 3952. It is the approval of ha hazardous materials. I was finding tons and tons of large quantities of aluminum, barium, strontium in the forms of oxides and sulfates. And of course I knew that there's industrial processes you may not have heard of, but it's bead blasting, pneumatic sanding, shot peening. There is certain medias that's similar to that that is used. However, I had already accounted for that. I would sit and look at this computer system and say, this shop wants to order this paint. I'm going to tie it to a task. We had to know what was being used, why it was being used, tracking it cradle to grave on how we were going to dispose of it to be compliant with OSHA and the EPA. One of the legal requirements in approving these is looking at what used to be called a material safety data sheet. On that sheet, it's going to list the manufacturer. It's going to list some maybe acquired personal protective equipment that needs to be used or some ways to mitigate the exposures. These electronic MSDSs, did not have a manufacturer name. They were very vague. They almost looked to me like somebody had made it and scanned it into the system. So I asked the question, what is this being used for? I never got an answer, so I didn't approve it. And it sat there. And then the heat came down. Why aren't you, are you behind on your 3952s? 
Only a select few of us did that. So I started asking questions. And at that point, my demonization began. You know, I, I made my rank. I was decorated. I was a non-commissioned officer of the quarter. I won lots of awards. I had no reason for anyone to attempt to demonize me. So then I get moved over to the other Air Logistics Center. There's only two in the Air Force, which is in Warner Robins, Georgia. This kind of carried with me, and I thought, you know what? Should I revisit this? Is it worth it? Did I hit something? Maybe it's need to know. I started finding the same things at Robbins Air Force Base. I was now doing some more investigation work. Part of what I did was to use a high volume air sampler to air sample um, up to, I'd say, a football field in about 10 minutes. I also conducted soil sampling because I thought, you know, if, if this is real and they are spraying this, it's going to get to the ground. So I conducted air sampling, I conducted soil sampling, and I was getting high levels of these contaminants. When I started asking the question again under a new commander, I never in my life thought I would have somebody look me in the face and tell me, I am questioning you. Is there something wrong with you? You've been looking really depressed lately. You know I can put you under a mental evaluation for a, up to 120 days. Who would take care of your daughter? Because I was divorced at the time. As soon as I heard that, I knew. It validated everything I ever thought. And I thought, I have spent nine years of my life trying to protect human health, and here we are violating law after law after law. Just sitting here, instead of protecting the people, we are poisoning the people. And I've never got up so much courage from that fear of being thrown in a cage, because when you're in the military, folks, you're a number. You are a number, and every aspect of your life is controlled. I was so lucky that my enlistment was coming up and I was supposed to re-enlist. I ran and did not look back, and I have been blowing the whistle and shouting ever since. And I left October 27, 2010. Thank you. It didn't just end there, though. You got to remember, there's a whole career field of people that work in bioenvironmental engineering. A lot of those people were told, do not talk to me. Do not talk to her. Do not email her. They were given no contact orders. Because my biggest thing was, if I'm just so you know, dishonest, don't you think somebody would come out and say you know, she was never in the military or something negative to discredit me? They've ignored me, but they've tried to silence me. Every time I fly, I am pulled into a secret room. I, I literally am tagged in the system for the TSA. It is difficult. As an industrial hygienist, I do very well for myself, but it has been so difficult after leaving the federal government to maintain employment. Nowadays, everyone runs background checks on you, and the first thing they look at is, wow, here's a whistleblower. And you ask yourself, if this is true and we are spraying the people, where are the pilots? Where are the people? I don't know if you pay attention, but look at Snowden. Look at, look at Manning. People don't come forward because these supposed Whistleblower Act protections that you have are not enforced, they're not supported, and they really don't exist. But what I want you to take from this is to understand that I am being completely honest with you and that geoengineering is occurring, it's been occurring, it is not new, and your tax dollars are funding this. I 100% know that the U.S. Air Force was involved, and it kind of... I think back to all these things that I never had noticed. You don't, if you don't know what to look for, you can't look for something. And once I realized a process they were trying to hide, people have come out of the woodworks, from EPA compliance officers to ex-people that I worked with in my career field. Well, I cannot state for obvious reasons. I've had pilots come forward. I've had people come forward that actually load the canisters on the planes. These people don't come forward because they are afraid that they're going to end up like Snowden. And I continue to speak to let people know I've been screaming about this for three years and I'm still here. And why are you so afraid? Because many of these people are on active duty. And if you are willing to die for your country, supporting you know, the Constitution and 
defending us from enemies foreign and domestic. You were willing to die for your country, but now you're scared. You are scared and cowardly to talk about this. So I'm not just speaking to all of you in this room. I'm speaking to all those people that are going to watch this online and watch it on YouTube. Because you can come forward, you can help expose this, and we can stop it. So many people want to ask, why? Why is this occurring? That's for later thought. From weather modification to weather weaponry, there, there's numerous reasons under Agenda 21 and tons of theories. But my job as an industrial hygienist is to make sure that I comply with the laws and enforce them. So it is unethical every day for all the other people that are out there that work in preventive health or even physicians that aren't speaking about this. They need to. So one thing I want to tell you is what you can do about it. The biggest hurdle that we have is disinformation sites. I never say them, but I'm going to today so that you know if anyone ever gives these to you as a reference to debunk you, it's Metabunk and Contrail Science. Those are two websites that are ran by a government shill named Mick West. And he is a computer gaming programmer who tries to tell you about persistent contrails. So somebody who isn't even credentialed in chemistry or physics or ecology, none of that, is trying to tell you that you're crazy. Okay? So also on social media, don't just hit the share button. There are links. You have to understand that I have met people who used to be purposeful disinformation trolls, as we call them. These people are paid to pretend that they're you, to get you on board to believe a website or an article, just so that you look so vulnerable. And then later it will be deemed non-credible, and then you look non-credible. So please vet research. And if you have something to write with, I want you to take down my email. It is Kristen, K-R-I-S-T-E-N, Megan, M-E-G-H-A-N, at gmail.com. And by emailing me, I can give you some information for what I'm about to tell you. If you still don't believe it, or you still want to convince people, there's something you can do. You can take a glass jar. It needs to be a glass jar, so there's no BPAs. Take a rain sample, and take a snow sample. I tried to disencourage the soil sampling because everyone's background of where you live is different because a lot of the materials that are used in geoengineering are natural occurring in earth just not in the industrialized form that they are used so if you take these rain samples and you take the snow samples email me because i cannot publicly tell you where to send them because we've actually been blackballed by labs who refuse to run our samples and a problem that is occurring is people are sending in rain samples to labs that don't realize how low the limit of detection needs to be because these are nanoparticulates. They are very small. So if you email me, I can tell you where to send in your samples, and it's only around $50. That may be tough on some people, but it's way cheaper than maybe what you assumed. So I just want everyone to know and understand that of all things, of all the freedoms that we are losing, geoengineering is the number one issue that we are facing because you can have guns and money and you can have everything. If you don't have food and water and you are dying of respiratory or neurological illnesses, what does it matter? So you've heard about vaccines and you'll hear you know, about smart meters and you'll hear about other issues like fracking. These are all systemic effects. We are getting overexposed to toxins. People will tell you fluorides in the water, but it's not a lot. It is a lot because you're getting it everywhere in your food, you know, water that you drink. Everything is, excuse me, is washed with that water. And you're getting your vaccines. All this, it's a coupled systemic effect, and our bodies cannot metabolize these toxins. So I just want to thank you for taking the time to listen to my story. And I will continue to shout from the rooftops. I don't care how many jobs I lose. I don't care how many friends or family I lose. Because I took an oath. And in nine years, I was not able to honor that oath. But I am today. Ah, sí, sí, sí.
Sí, 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 sí. Me partió el cuello, tío. Mira, 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 mira. Está haciendo de lado, está de lado, ahora sí se le ha puesto ala. Qué espectáculo de Chen Trail. Pero eso, eso, eso puede que no sea un avión, tío, que sea un dron o algo, ¿sabes? Mira la curva que está haciendo el, el de. Oh. Yo lo que sé es que vuelo una altitud flipante. Pero flipante. Yo me iba de aquí. Yo me iba de este pueblo, Francis. Hallo, ich begrüße euch alle. Ich finde es toll, dass hier so viele Mitmenschen sind. Zum Thema Frieden möchte ich nur sagen, dass ich fest davon überzeugt bin, dass das, was wir hier machen, nämlich unseren eigenen Kopf benutzen, unsere Fähigkeit zu denken, selber Schlussfolgerungen zu ziehen, Informationen zu verarbeiten, daraus neue Informationen zu machen, das ist das, was uns dazu äh, gemacht hat, dass wir so diskreditiert werden als Friedensbewegung. Denn das darf nicht sein, dass wir selber denken. Ich bin Luft- und Raumfahrttechniker und habe Flugzeuge repariert und so weiter. Ich möchte euch jetzt mal ganz kurz erzählen, was ich gemacht habe. Ich habe auf dem militärischen Sonderflughafen Oberpfaffenhofen in Zusammenarbeit mit dem Deutschen Luft- und Raumfahrtzentrum ein Flugzeug mit einer Sprüheinrichtung ausgestattet, was an unserem Himmel giftige Substanzen versprüht. Als ich mit den Beweisen dafür, den Fotos und allem drum und dran, zu meiner grünen Abgeordneten im Bürgerbüro gegangen bin und gesagt habe, hier, so sieht's aus, ich stelle mich jedem Untersuchungsausschuss zur Verfügung, ist drei Tage später mein Boss zu mir nach Hause gekommen und hat gesagt, ich muss dich entlassen, da werden von ganz oben große Räder gedreht, die ich nicht mehr halten kann. Ich kriege keinen Job mehr in der Luftfahrt. Jeder, der gerne wissen möchte, wie das aussieht und wie das gemacht wird, der kann dann zu mir kommen, ich habe hier alles mit. Ich möchte dazu nur sagen, als wir fertig waren mit dem Umbau dieses Fliegers, also wir haben den innen entkernt, haben die ganzen Tanks eingebaut, haben die Leitung gelegt, haben diese Sprüheinrichtung äh, installiert, da wurde uns gesagt, ich war ja Zivilangestellter äh, unter Kontrolle des Militärs, dass das Deutsche Luft- und Raumfahrtzentrum das praktisch als Test macht, ja, der Flieger fliegt vorne weg, dann fliegt denen ihr Partikelmessflugzeug hinterher und misst Partikeldichte, Ausbringungsparameter und so weiter und so weiter. Die wollen ja schließlich wissen, wie sich das verbreitet. Und wir waren fertig und da kam dann das Militär und hat uns angewiesen, Vollschutzanzüge, äh, Vollschutzanzüge und Atemmasken zu tragen, denn die Tanks müssen jetzt befüllt werden und die Substanzen, die da reinkommen, ja, Aluminium, Sulfide, Bariumoxide, was weiß ich, sind durchsetzt mit Nanopartikel, großen äh, Polymerverbindungen, die sind für euch hochgiftig, also ihr habt jetzt Schutzanzüge zu tragen. Und so viel dazu. Also ich wollte nur sagen, wir fliegen in eine ökologische Katastrophe und jeder, der das nicht begreifen will, den kann ich gerne die Beweise zeigen und ich stelle mich jedem Untersuchungsausschuss zur Verfügung. Ich bin bereit...
Avec les lobbies qui vous dirigent, les lobbies agroalimentaires et pharmaceutiques, vous faites en sorte de nous rendre malades volontairement. Et oui, que voulez-vous Cela fait marcher l'économie. Nous savons tous aujourd'hui à quel point l'argent est devenu l'élément central de vos politiques au mépris de l'éthique et de la morale. Nous mangeons de la merde à longueur de journée. Nous respirons de l'air pollué par des usines ou via les chemtrails. Nous tombons malades à cause de ce que nous mangeons et de ce que nous respirons. Et il suffit de voir l'explosion du nombre de cancers aujourd'hui. Tout cela n'est pas anodin. Tout cela est voulu, car cela fait marcher l'économie, l'économie de la mort. En effet, un homme malade permet aux banques de s'enrichir. Bien entendu, puisque pour combler le trou de la sécurité sociale, le gouvernement emprunte de l'argent aux banques. L'homme malade, c'est donc un jackpot pour les banques. Nous respirons de l'air pollué par des usines ou via les chemtrails. Nous respirons de l'air pollué par des usines ou via les chemtrails. The argument then is to say that these, I mean, the, the program's argument is to say that they're um, seeding clouds with these heavy metals. I mean, what is, what is there, what is the science behind the, or the logic, let's say, behind that science? That's a great question because it's very confusing to people. First, the semantics are very important. If people want to gain traction with this issue, it's imperative they use the science terms climate engineering or solar radiation management, uh, geoengineering or stratospheric aerosol geoengineering. So those terms lead to hard science. The chemtrails term by design leads to conspiracy theory and hoax. So semantics are important and it's important also that people understand this is not about cloud seeding for rain, not at all. Solar radiation management the express purpose is to block a percentage of the sun's incoming thermal energy with light scattering reflective particulates, i.e. aluminum. So the goal is to block the sun, but this has horrific effects on the hydrological cycle. Uh, of course, it's toxic. It shreds the ozone layer. Again, we're seeing uh, ozone readings now, and we're metering this, we're not guessing. We're seeing UVB levels that are in some cases a thousand percent higher than what we're being told. So people need to think for themselves. The sun feels hot on your skin because it is. It's, it's at very dangerous levels. Again, they're not disclosing this. And uh, people need, this issue is of immense gravity from too many directions to go into. So that's why I focused all my energy on this because I feel based on available data, if we don't stop the climate engineering, uh, the planet's not gonna have much left of its life support systems very soon. Mm -hmm. So you've, you've mentioned uh, there might be a correlation between the rise in autism and ADD and other of these illnesses, and what about, for example, the respiratory illnesses that are going around? Um, there's, you know, there's a lot of people that have been sick with, mer not MERS, but other kinds of respiratory systems, especially for example this year. Could that be a byproduct of the, what's being sprayed through geoengineering? I would answer much more definitively, Sean. I, there is absolutely, positively, no question. There's a connection. Again, obviously, there's other causes as well. But when we know beyond any reasonable doubt that this material is raining down on us. We know it's in the breathable air column because we're lab testing for it. And we know the effects. The human uh, organism doesn't respond well to these metals at all. And this is absolutely indisputable, peer-reviewed fact. So there, there's no question there's a connection. And what we see in the case of autism, a 10,000% increase since 1975, then you know, that should be raising a lot of red flags for a lot of people. And these programs have gone on, we know, since the late 40s. So uh, when we have geoengineers stating on the record, and this was on film on the record, the world's most recognized geoengineer, David Key, stating their goal of dumping 20 million tons of aluminum nanoparticulates in the atmosphere annually, uh, that, that is mathematically the greatest source of this kind of contamination, greater than all other sources combined. So there's no question there's a connection to all the respiratory issues, the asthma issues, Alzheimer's, autism. Again, I'm not saying this is the only cause. Of course not. But mathematically speaking, it's the greatest cause, period. Wow. So basically, our, gov our government is poisoning us. That's what you're saying. Yes, and we can all speculate as to intent, motive. Uh, that's things that uh, can be debated by people. But the bottom line is it's happening. We have studies from the U.S. Air Force on the effect of this type of nanoparticulate pollution from the late 90s. They absolutely know how lethal it is. How could they not know? And yet we, we have this going on. And the mentality, Sean, and this is, again, on film and on the record from geoengineers like David Keith from, uh, from Harvard, they believe this is a risk-to-risk -risk scenario, the risk of doing it versus the risk of not doing it. So the goal 
One of the stated goals, anyway, is to slow down a runaway greenhouse effect, to deflect some of the sun's incoming thermal energy. But what these scientists don't take into account is that the negative effects of these programs far outweigh any perceived benefit when it's, again, destroying the Earth's natural protection with the ozone layer. It's trapping as much or more heat than it deflects. It's destroying the hydrological cycle, the rain cycle, contaminating everything. This, this is the typical pharmaceutical approach corporate military industrial complex mentality just like we see on tv if you take this drug for this ailment by the way there's 20 other huge side effects you'll have and it may kill you and the next commercial sometimes is a, an attorney's group saying if you took this then call us and it's the same sort of mentality a lot of money's being made a lot of power is being exercised over populations and they're not about to give that up no matter how much damage it does could a strange substance found by a southwest arkansas man be part of a government test well, that's the question at the heart of a phenomenon called chemtrails, now getting widespread attention. Well, tonight, KSLA News 12 investigation reporter Jeff Farrell shows us the results of testing we had done about what's in our skies. Uh, it seemed like some mornings it was just crisscrossing the whole sky, and they were just, it was just like a giant checkerboard. Bill Nichols snapped several photos of the strange clouds from his home in Stamps, Arkansas. They begin as normal contrails from a jet engine, but do not fade away like a normal contrail. Soon after, he saw particles in the air. You know, because we'd see it drop to, to the ground in a haze. Nichols then noticed the material collecting on the ground. This is uh, water and stuff that I collected in bowls. I had it set out in my backyard on my dad's pickup truck. KSLA News 12 had the sample tested at a lab. The results? A high level of barium, 6.8 parts per million more than three times the toxic level set by the EPA. Armed with these lab results about the high levels of barium found in our sample, we decided to contact the Louisiana Department of Environmental Quality. They told us that yes, these levels are very unusual, but at the same time they added the caveat that proving the source is a whole other matter. Barium is a hallmark of other chemtrail testing, which even attracted attention from a Los Angeles TV station. There's already no shortage of unclassified weather modification programs by the government. But those who fear chemtrails could be secret biological or chemical testing on the public point to the 1977 Senate hearings in particular, which confirmed 239 populated areas had been contaminated with biological agents between 1949 and 1969. Later, the 1994 Rockefeller Report concluded hundreds of thousands of military personnel were also subjected to secret biological experiments over the last 60 years. But could secret testing be underway yet again? I'd rather it be something inert and benign, you know, something that's, you know, not causing any damage, but uh, I'd like to know what it is. KSLA News 12 discovered chemtrails are even mentioned by name in the initial draft of House Bill 2977 back in 2001 under the Space Preservation Act. But the military denies any such program exists. Jeff Farrell, KSLA News 12 reporting. And you know, it turns out until nine years ago, the government had the right under U.S. law to conduct secret testing on the American public under specific conditions. Only a public outcry repealed part of that law with some exceptions. Now, Jeff's report mentioned high levels of barium linked to those alleged chemtrails. We wanted to find out exactly what effects barium has on the body. We spoke with Mark Ryan, the director of the Poison Control Center. Ryan tells KSLA News 12 that short-term exposure can lead to anything from stomach to chest pains. Long-term exposure causes blood pressure problems. Ryan addressed concerns by chemtrail researchers that barium could be meant to wear down a person's immune system. Anything that causes ill effects in the body long-term chronically is going to affect your, your ability to, uh, because it's just it's constantly working on the body. So from that aspect, yeah, that's a potential. Brian says he's conducted research on his own about secret government testing on the public, but he's still a bit skeptical about the uh, alleged chemtrails, at least at the moment, because the Poison Control Center has seen no calls about exposure to barium. Seguimos aquí en Zamora, es así, y les voy a plantear una pregunta. ¿Es posible que por razones de investigación sobre el cambio climático o el control de las comunicaciones se esté controlando, contaminando, mejor dicho, el suelo agrario, el agua y las plantas? 
Con esta pregunta se lanzaba la conferencia que esta tarde ha tenido lugar en Zamora, organizado por el Frente Cívico de Zamora. Y para resolver las preguntas y darnos las respuestas, está con nosotros esta noche la ponente Josefina Fraile, presidenta de la Asociación Terra Sostenible, promotora de la plataforma cívica Guardacielos, licenciada en Ciencias Políticas y además con varios posgrados. Buenas noches y bienvenida. Buenas noches, muchísimas gracias por esta posibilidad. Un tema, la verdad, que bastante interesante, preocupante, si nos ponemos a investigar, y que tiene muchas preguntas en el aire. Así que vamos a intentar empezar a resolver algunas de ellas. ¿Podemos decir, como planteaban eh, desde el título de, de esta conferencia en la que ha participado esta tarde en Zamora, que existen programas de manipulación climática que supuestamente están contaminando nuestro, nuestro medio ambiente, nuestra tierra? Así es, existen y no son nada nuevo. Los programas de manipulación climática datan de más de 60 años eh, y son un arma de guerra. Se utilizaron por vez primera en Vietnam para inundar la senda Ho Chi Minh, que era la que se utilizaba, la que utilizaban los vietnamitas para autoabastecerse. El fin era la, el de ampliar la época de los monzones en 50 días, de manera que haciendo caer un verdadero diluvio por esa senda fuera totalmente intransitable para cualquier tipo de abastecimiento. ¿no? Eh, fue tal la devastación que causó este arma que finalmente en el año 76-77 se prohibió eh, mediante dos convenios um, en Naciones Unidas. Eh, se prohibieron entonces las armas climáticas eh, para la guerra y para fines hostiles. Por lo tanto, efectivamente, existe ese arma. ¿Qué es lo que hace o lo que se hace con ese arma? Pues con ese arma se pueden generar lluvias, se pueden generar tormentas, nubes, se pueden generar rayos, o sea, tormentas eléctricas, eh, descargas en cualquier lugar del, del, del mundo, pero también se puede generar todo lo contrario, es decir, se pueden utilizar para deshacer frentes eh, lluviosos, eh, para deshacer granizo, para deshacer eh, frentes de nieve y, y claro, bueno, también lógicamente se utilizan para generar sequías. ¿Qué es lo que ocurre? Que este arma, bueno, pues de control climática, al que la posee, le da un control prácticamente absoluto, un dominio absoluto sobre los recursos del planeta y sobre todo los recursos alimentarios. Quiere decir que en fin, cuando hay un país que controla esta tecnología, se puede decir que controla el grifo del mundo. Uh -huh. O bien haces lo que él te dice y tienes agua, o bien no estás de acuerdo y te dejan el país uh, totalmente desabastecido de agua, deshaciendo, rompiendo, destruyendo los recursos hídricos, generando sequías prolongadas, que lógicamente conllevan a la capacidad de alimentar a la población de ese país y por lo tanto condenarlos a la hambruna. Uh -huh. Esto existe, hay países que hoy disponen de esa tecnología, pero digamos que los Estados Unidos ha llegado a incorporarla como parte de su política exterior. En el informe de las fuerzas aéreas norteamericanas um, se llama, fíjese, además el título poseyendo el clima para 2025. Con ese título que se explica por sí mismo, pues nos quedamos verdaderamente sin palabras y sin aliento. Que alguien pueda arrogarse el poder de controlar el grifo del mundo es algo que nos supera a todos. Entonces, bueno, eh, en este mismo informe se dice que formará parte de la política exterior de los Estados Unidos, quiera el mundo o no quiera, y que esta política se va a imponer a través de eh, convenios bilaterales, a través de eh, organizaciones como la OTAN, que es lo que nos compete a nosotros, o a través de las Naciones Unidas. De hecho, en la última Asamblea General de Naciones Unidas, en el apartado D de su quinto informe sobre cambio climático, el IPCC ya de alguna manera reivindica esto que se denomina geoingeniería. Uh -huh. eh, visto así, la verdad que da un poco de terror, aunque por otro lado uno puede pensar, bueno, pues no está mal, ¿no? Si se ha avanzado, se ha podido descubrir una tecnología que nos ayuda, podría facilitarle la vida a muchas personas en zonas donde sufren sequía 
o donde pues a lo mejor se necesita a lo mejor cierto control, pero utilizado de esta manera puede, puede asustar porque hasta qué punto se puede presionar con esta o Estados Unidos o algún país poderoso puede presionar con esta tecnología a otros. Bueno, está claro que cuando tienes esta tecnología puedes presionar a quien te dé la gana. De hecho, yo el año pasado, no, este año, estuve muy preocupada con la reacción de Pyongyang, por ejemplo, en, en Corea del Norte, que estaba decidido a iniciar una guerra nuclear, ¿no? Eh, y pensaba lanzar una guerra nuclear contra los Estados Unidos. Bueno, eh, Estados Unidos tiene una lista de países, unos, ellos en su jerga de clasificación de los países, pues unos son países parias, donde no se respetan los derechos humanos, etcétera, pero otros son los países canallas, que son los que están totalmente en contra del gobierno americano. Entre esos países canallas está, por ejemplo, eh, Corea del Norte, donde hace que no llueve una, una eternidad y lógicamente no pueden alimentar a sus, a sus propios ciudadanos. Entonces llega un momento en que finalmente en fin, no, no se justifica la, la actitud de este gobernante, ¿no? pero se llega a entender la desesperación de un gobernante y la desesperación de un pueblo sabiendo que le están obligando a pasar hambruna solamente porque están en la lista de, de los países eh, canalla. ¿no? Mm. Cuba es otro ejemplo. ¿no? Pero bueno, Cuba ha tenido recursos felizmente para restaurar sus, uh, sus sistemas hídricos y en ello están. Uh -huh. eh, Josefina, la gente se preguntará en casa, bueno, esto nos queda muy lejos. Estamos hablando de países que están a miles de kilómetros de, de Zamora, pero sí que aquí ya empieza a haber preocupación. ¿Dónde, en qué zonas se están empezando a despertar las sospechas ante esa utilización de la geoingeniería? Bueno, una cosa que tengo que explicar es lo siguiente. Eh, en el momento en que, este, en que esta, en estos métodos, esta tecnología de guerra se prohíbe por Naciones Unidas, eh, lógicamente, eh, vamos a hacernos la pregunta, ¿es que un país que tiene el dominio, el dominio del control del clima, que le da el dominio sobre todos los recursos del planeta, sobre todos los, los uh, países del mundo, va a renunciar a ese dominio porque ha firmado, por cierto, con mucho retraso, el convenio de Naciones Unidas. No, no va a hacerlo. Lo único que le queda a este país es cambiar el collar al perro, es decir, es generar un, un, una, un problema global para, para después venir con una solución global. El problema global fue el generar el, 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 la nueva religión del cambio climático, ¿no? echándole la culpa al, al exceso de CO2 en la atmósfera. Bien, entonces... Eh, la solución es un poco como el, el bombero pirómano, ¿no? después vienen con la solución, decir, mira, aquí esto eh, está fatal, eh, hay mucha acumulación de gases efecto invernadero de CO2 en la atmósfera y aquí la única, la única solución, bueno, pues no es la lógica, sería se acabó el CO2, es decir, vamos a recortar drásticamente las emisiones de CO2, no, no, ellos lo que dicen es, mire, aquí esto vamos a resolverlo de otra manera, aquí viene la geoingeniería, que tiene una fórmula extraordinaria, es la de meter miles de aviones eh, en, 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 en los cielos de todo el mundo y dispersar aerosoles de partículas metálicas, ¿para qué? Pues mire usted, así el sol, cuando vamos a impedir que el sol, los rayos del sol, den directamente a la Tierra, porque como va a haber una especie de filtro solar, una especie de escudo, van a rebotar en ese escudo de nuevo al espacio y no llegarán a la Tierra. Bueno, eso, eso es de locos, es de locos. Entonces, aparte, la físico nuclear, nuestra querida Rosalie Bertel, que por cierto era religiosa y no defendía eh, ningún interés corporativo, eh, decía que eh, esto matemáticamente era imposible. Aparte de todo, curiosamente, al que se le ocurrió esta brillantísima idea, esto, esto, to, todas estas eh, eh, propuestas y fórmulas vienen del laboratorio de la, de la bomba nuclear. Al que se le ocurrió esta brillante propuesta fue al padre de la bomba de hidrógeno, eh, un tal Edward Teller, que era el más jovencito del proyecto Manhattan padre de la bomba de hidrógeno, uh -huh. bueno, pues se le ocurrió y él no, él no era creyente de que eh, existiera un calentamiento global. Él lo ponía en duda, pero sin embargo, crea una fórmula para contrarrestarlo y, digamos, para, de alguna manera, 
enfriar la atmósfera, ¿no? O sea, Josefina, para que nos quede claro, eh, en la década de los 60 se inventa una tecnología, un instrumento que se utiliza para la guerra, se prohíbe, pero esa herramienta se puede seguir utilizando o se está utilizando para el control de, del cambio climático para contrarrestar las emisiones de, de CO2 en principio. No, no se, puede, no se puede utilizar. Es decir, eso es lo que nos cuentan. Para que ellos puedan seguir con sus investigaciones y aplicaciones de control de clima como arma, como arma uh -huh. bélica, ellos han disfrazado esas actividades le han puesto el nombre de geoingeniería para paliar el calentamiento global. Pero eso es lo que nos cuentan, lo que en realidad es, es lo que hay detrás. ¿no? Uh -huh. Es que esto sigue siendo un arma, y es, eh, y es un arma climática con un, un impacto totalmente incalculable sobre, sobre la naturaleza y sobre la vida de las personas. Y esto, la manipulación del clima, la geoingeniería, es la manipulación deliberada del clima a escala global. Ha empezado en los Estados Unidos en la década de los 90, pero a nosotros nos llegó de mano de la OTAN eh, a partir del, del 99. Si bien antes ya se habían hecho algunos ensayos, como nos consta desde el año 85, con el gobierno socialista. ¿no? Entonces, eh, bien, ahora eh, ya no son ensayos, ahora es un programa en toda regla ¿eh? y que, lógicamente, al ser global, nos afecta a toda España, pero aparte de estos programas, después hay ensayos particulares. Y un ensayo particular, que no sabemos de qué ni para qué, se está llevando a cabo en la Guareña. Uh -huh. Sobre ese tema nos queríamos entrar. Son ya algunos los agricultores que están empezando a preocuparse por esta cuestión, porque en sus tierras han empezado a encontrar cosas que no tenía que existir, pruebas, ¿no? Vamos a, a ir viendo eh, en qué consisten eh, esos, a lo mejor, esas señales. ¿Cuáles son eh, esos indicios o esas pruebas que, que han dado la boda de, de alarma a los agricultores de la Guareña? Bien, pues esas pruebas fue... Eh, un día ellos estaban visitando sus campos y vieron en sus parcelas eh, pues un montón de, de, de escamas, de partículas que brillaban. Que claro, podemos caer ahora, por ejemplo, en este vídeo, ¿no? Bueno, eh, eh, lo que está cayendo en este vídeo y, que, y que, prueba, que, que prueba que están siendo objeto de ensayos particulares, mire, esto son fibras, esto, esto no es aluminio, ¿ve? ¿eh? Estos son fibras que algunas son largas, eh, eh, pueden llegar hasta 5 metros de largas y después otras son malejas, como la que hemos traído aquí para enseñarosla, ¿no? ¿Veis? O sea, o sea, estas fibras de repente caen del cielo. Sí, sí, los aviones fumigan y, y fumigan aerosoles, pero hay otras cosas que también fumigan y una de esas cosas son fibras. ¿eh? Eh, fumigan nanotecnología, pero como es tan pequeña, pues eso no lo podemos ver, pero esto sí que lo podemos ver y lo hemos podido grabar. ¿Y estas fibras qué tienen? ¿Qué contienen? Eh, estas fibras no sabemos lo que contienen hasta que no se haga un análisis y yo espero verdaderamente que desde el SEPRONA se tomen muestras para hacer un análisis, porque está claro que esto tiene un fin, esto eh, está cayendo en, en una zona que además eh, está dedicada a los cultivos eh, biológicos, es como si hubiera ahí eh, un interés en, que, en, en destruir el, el potencial que tiene una comarca como la Guareña en cultivos biológicos, ¿no? Entonces, esto está claro que tiene un efecto. Después también tiene un efecto en la salud, porque muchas de estas fibras, no sé si estas precisamente, cuando caen en la piel es como si anidasen dentro y finalmente produjesen unas enfermedades cutáneas que, bueno, que se expresan en la piel, pero que finalmente llegan dentro y, y, son, y son muy graves y son muy difíciles de resolver. Son nuevas enfermedades una de ellas eh, ha recibido el nombre de morgellons porque son estas mismas fibras que entran dentro del cuerpo, que se multiplican y que se alimentan del hierro y del oxígeno de nuestra sangre. Con lo uh -huh. cual, pues ahí tenemos problemas de, de falta de, de hierro en la sangre, de cansancio, de anemia y, y, y lógicamente, bueno, pues si, si el, el oxígeno también... Eh, nos lo llevan, pues estaremos muy cansados y 
sin, sin, sin después, eh, todavía no conocemos qué, qué otras implicaciones a nivel eh, interno y cómo afectan los órganos internos. Eh. Uh -huh. Estamos colaborando con un instituto americano que se llama Carnicom, que por cierto eh, merece todos nuestros respetos porque no recibe ninguna subvención pública, eh, toda su investigación se lleva a cabo con donaciones porque él necesita esa libertad para poder buscar la verdad. Uh -huh. Josefina, entonces... Eh... Ya agricultores de la Guareña están empezando a denunciar esta situación. Eh, hemos visto como una de esas grabaciones mostraba que caían eh, esas partículas, esos hilos, pero también os comentaba antes... Aquí tenéis una madejita, o sea, es que caen en madejas también, ¿no? <risa> Nos comentaba también que caían que aviones eh, en distintos vuelos fumigan aluminio, ¿no? Partículas de aluminio sí. que se encuentran en, en Entre la otras tierra. cosas. Entre otras cosas, nuestros análisis nos dan un elevado índice de aluminio. El aluminio efectivamente es el material, el, el mineral más abundante en la naturaleza, pero nunca viene eh, libre, no vienen escamas como las que hemos recogido. ¿no? Entonces, efectivamente, aquí hay una fumigación de óxidos de metales en toda regla, que esto es, supone un atentado medioambiental, o sea, no solo contra la naturaleza, sino contra el ser humano, porque es que intoxica toda nuestra cadena de vida, desde el aire a los alimentos, al agua, ¿no? Uh -huh. Y es que no hay alternativa, no tenemos opción. Pero siempre que se habla del espacio aéreo, se habla de que, para, por ejemplo, volar sobre nuestro país, requieren una serie de permisos, de autorizaciones... ¿Cómo es posible que se estén realizando este tipo de, de, de vuelos, de, de fumigaciones a, aéreas? A ver, estos vuelos hay que decir que eh, la mayor parte de estos vuelos son eh, aviones militares, si bien últimamente también tenemos evidencias de que hay vuelos civiles que están implicados en estas fumigaciones, eh, no sé cómo decirla, en realidad estos aviones no tienen ninguna marca de identidad, no tienen números, no tienen banderas, eh, son aviones que están excluidos del sistema oficial del radar. ¿eh? Por otro lado, en España y los demás países de la Unión Europea, desgraciadamente se está perdiendo soberanía, todo tipo de soberanía, y desgraciadamente hemos perdido la soberanía de nuestros cielos, es decir, el alto espacio aéreo ya la soberanía no la tiene el gobierno español, la tiene la OTAN, pero ¿cómo es posible? ¿Cómo es posible? En todo caso, ¿Eh? En todo caso, estos vuelos no están utilizando el espacio aéreo. Estos vuelos bajan hasta 2.000 y menos metros de altitud. ¿eh? Eh, entonces, eh, quiero decir que en ese momento el gobierno, el gobierno español es responsable porque estos no podrían hacer esos vuelos sin autorización del gobierno. Uh -huh. Incluso a nivel de la Junta de Castilla y León, esos uh -huh. vuelos hay que paralizarlos. No se puede permitir que esto continúe. Esto es, esto es eh, un atentado, pero y esto es un atentado con unas consecuencias totalmente genocidas. Uh -huh. Porque es que no se puede salvar nadie. Yo, por ejemplo, puedo decidir no comer transgénicos, si sé qué alimentos son transgénicos, y, y digo, bueno, me gasto un poco más y, y compro biológico. Pero es que aquí no puedes elegir. Aquí tienes que respirar, tienes que beber y tienes que comer. Y encima, si te están envenenando los alimentos, el agua, bueno, pues entonces, ¿qué es lo que hay que hacer? Yo tengo mucha confianza eh, y hago un llamamiento verdaderamente de corazón a la clase médica y a la clase judicial. Esto es muy grave, la salud pública es un bien jurídico que hay que defender a ultranza y solo ellos, actuando en derecho, pueden hacerlo. Uh -huh. Otra cosa... Me, me, me sumo, me apunto, reivindico una frase que tenía Napoleón que decía no hay nada que la opinión pública no pueda cambiar. Yo espero que así sea y os agradezco de todo corazón este espacio que nos habéis dado porque nos ayuda a formar opinión pública. Josefina, ¿se está denunciando a las administraciones, a, a la justicia? Nosotros hemos puesto, una, hemos puesto una denuncia el 19 de julio al Seprona eh, estamos muy, esperanz muy esperanzados, eh, pensamos o creemos o queremos creer que esto va a llegar a buen puerto, que el juez que se ocupa del caso eh, esperemos que vaya hasta el final 
Y bueno, y donde sí se ha denunciado es en la Unión Europea. Uh -huh. Hemos um, llevado el tema al Parlamento Europeo en el mes de abril y, y bueno, eh, en estos momentos hay en marcha, eh, claro, lo hemos llevado ¿por qué? porque los ciudadanos de la Unión Europea es que estamos todos en la misma situación, nuestros gobiernos lo niegan, porque imagínense usted si lo admiten, la, el coste y la responsabilidad civil y legal es que no habría manera de cubrirlo por todos los daños eh, materiales y en vidas que esto ocasiona. ¿no? Entonces nosotros lo que hemos eh, hecho ha sido denunciar estos hechos al Parlamento Europeo y pedir la tutela efectiva del Parlamento Europeo para la ciudadanía uh -huh. europea. Uh -huh. hemos, tenemos en marcha ahora mismo una petición al Parlamento Europeo, eh, que es esta, que se puede encontrar en, en nuestra web de guardacielos, www.guardacielos.org, y ahí se puede firmar la petición al Parlamento Europeo. Tenemos mucha esperanza en que si recogemos muchísimas firmas, eh, como estamos de cara a unas elecciones europeas el próximo mayo eh, de 2014, eh, podamos eh, esas firmas utilizarlas de manera... a um, hacer presión y a que se haga una investigación independiente. Porque, Josefina, hemos hablado del caso de los agricultores de la Guareña, que aquí en Zamora hay varios que han empezado a denunciar, a recoger pruebas, pero se está dando en todo el territorio, ¿no? Hay en otros sitios de Castilla y León y del país sí, 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 sí. y de otros países europeos donde se están dando. O sea, no es un caso aislado de, de aquí, por ejemplo, de Zamora, sino que se está dando en más lugares. Sí, sí. Eh, bueno, aquí en esta... En, en el dossier de la conferencia tenemos unas, unas fotos de todos los países que participaron, uh -huh. 15, y entonces ahí se ve cómo verdaderamente son uh, acciones a nivel global. ¿no? Eh, en Europa eh, no se salva ningún país. Entonces, bueno, mira, aquí tenemos una foto del, del el Pinar del Maderal, que en un año ha muerto. Entonces, aquí tenemos una foto, bueno, de aquí de un avión de Emiratos eh, fumigando y mirad, mirad lo que resulta de las fumigaciones. Esta, estas fotos son muy alarmantes. Eh, nosotros conocemos al mayor productor de energía eólica en California, colaboramos con él eh, y él era una persona que no creía en estas cosas. Eh, pero empezó a darse cuenta de que sus placas solares justamente estaban produciendo a 60%. Y entonces empezó a investigar y decía, ah, pues a ver si estos locos que están denunciando esto van a tener razón. Desde entonces no ha dejado de investigar. Son 10 años ya de militancia en su caso denunciando estas, um, estas barbaridades. ¿no? Y esperamos entre todos, bueno, pues poder ellos ahora mismo lo que están haciendo es... Eh, no hay un debate público, un tema tan grave como este no hay un debate público. ¿Por qué? Porque en los medios de comunicación uh -huh. solo se habla de cambio climático y de CO2. ¿Por qué en los medios de comunicación no se habla de geoingeniería o de la manipulación del clima? ¿Saben por qué? Este debate lo tienen perdido de antemano, porque la gente, la gente sencilla, la gente de a pie, es coherente, es cuerda, los que no están cuerdos son ellos, por Dios, ¿a quién se le ocurre una cosa así? Y saben que ese debate lo tienen perdido de antemano, porque la gente está harta de ser dirigida por aprendices de brujos. ¿eh? Entonces, esa es la razón por la que no abren un, un debate, pero sin embargo están utilizando la publicidad subliminal, ¿eh? están utilizando en las escuelas con el programa GLOB, eh, los maestros sacan a los niños al, al campo y les enseñan a predecir a predecir el tiempo mirando las estelas, pero hombre, por Dios, no se está usted dando cuenta que está cayendo en un programa de manipulación, de endoctrinamiento de, de las criaturas. Entonces, bueno, eh, utilizan a Walt Disney, el, el, último, el último film de Walt Disney es Dusty, un, un, un avión que es un avión fumigador, pero que le da miedo de las alturas. Entonces, bueno, es así como poco a poco quieren normalizar la geoingeniería en la cabeza de la gente. Pero nosotros no estamos por la labor, estamos denunciando toda esa publicidad subliminal, vamos a poner a todos a descubierto y desde luego espero que la opinión pública nos acompañe para poner fin a este horror, porque esto no tiene palabras. Pues Josefina, gracias por eh, haber estado con nosotros, darnos los datos y que cada uno en su casa pueda formar una opinión ante 
hechos que están ahí, que lo pueden comprobar eh, la, las pruebas, las tienen algunos de esos agricultores que piensen y se reflexionen sobre todo muchas veces sobre lo que sobrevuela sobre nuestras cabezas. El próximo día 31 vuelve a estar por Zamora en otra nueva charla, en Toro. Me imagino que las puertas abiertas ¿no? para que todo el mundo pueda escucharla. Exactamente, yo que lo sepan todos, me desplazaré todas las veces que haga falta, aunque sea un pequeño grupo de personas. Eh, es mi compromiso con, con esta sociedad eh, y con las generaciones venideras. Bueno, Muchas pues. gracias a vosotros. Chers téléspectateurs, bonjour. Avez-vous déjà entendu parler des sham trials Une parlementaire suédoise avoue que leur toxicité n'est pas une théorie de conspiration. Notre ciel n'est malheureusement plus que très rarement bleu azur. La raison Des avions pulvérisent dans l'atmosphère depuis de nombreuses années et ceci presque tous les jours, des substances chimiques, appelées sham trials, telles que du barium et de l'aluminium, sous prétexte de lutter contre le réchauffement climatique global. C'est ce qu'a avoué ouvertement, pour la première fois, une politicienne. Pernilla Hagberg est présidente du Parti écologique de Suède et rapporte que son gouvernement est aussi impliqué dans ce jeu-là. Ces pulvérisations auraient des conséquences insoupçonnées sur la santé des plantes, des animaux et des humains. D'après certains communiqués, on apprend qu'en Allemagne, des pulvérisations ont lieu depuis 2003 et aux USA depuis les années 90 déjà. Là-bas, ils font déjà face aux conséquences de cette pollution environnementale. Contamination des terres et des lacs, des semences normales ne peuvent plus germer. Ce que l'on peut entendre, c'est que depuis, les multinationales ont développé des semences résistantes à l'aluminium et qu'elles engrangent des sommes colossales de par leur vente. Jusqu'à quel point le profit prévaudra sur le bien-être de notre planète Sur ces quelques mots, je vous dis à très bientôt sur notre chaîne d'information. Aircraft making a condensation trail is very similar in many ways to when you go outside on a cold day and exhale, you create a condensation trail. That little cloud is a condensation trail. Now, if you take a two-mile walk on a cold day and you can turn around and you can see your condensation trail tracking all the way back for two miles, that's how crazy it is to think that what we're looking in the sky is actually condensation trails. The contrails, not the chemical, the contrails occur because of cold air, minus 30. It takes a high altitude, around 30,000 feet plus. There's a carbon dioxide and water vapor in that exhaust. That turns to ice crystals, and that's what you see, the white stream behind it. Those white crystals of ice warm up, dissolve, and the smoke goes away and it never lasts more than a minute. What we're seeing now, and I first could not believe it, and I started looking at the skies, and these are not normal, they're not natural. There's something going on, I don't know who it is or why they're doing it. All I can testify is it's not natural and it's not normal. It's gotta be some outside influence doing that. Thank you. I'm here to give you testimony that chemtrails, they're not contrails, are indeed real. They're spraying almost every day. I watch the clouds and watch the spraying program going on. I want to tell you that we're in very great danger from the pollution that's coming down over us. And we've been led astray by the military industrial complex. And they're responsible for the clouds creation and weather manipulation programs. They're dark operations. That's why they're not out in the media. I look around and I see people are starting to look up and see this. Many times I've spoken about chemtrails, and I get this blank look on my face. What are you talking about? I'm saying, look up. As a pilot, but before I fly, I look up. And so, boy, they're really out there working. When you look up at the sun and you see a white haze, that is aluminum floating in the air right now, and it's coming from the aircraft. There's a huge amount of uh, aluminum being found because these sprays have aluminum, strontium, barium, manganese. And uh, there's a lot of argument that aluminum is very common to be found. But aluminum is only common in a bonded form. It's not common in a free form, and we're finding high rates of free aluminum uh, in the soil, which is not natural. The metal compounds that are being used are environmentally dangerous. We need to be monitoring them. We need to be testing them. Okay, 
these previous guys, I've watched exactly what they do, and yes, they are correct. I've seen exactly the same stuff, so ditto marks on those. You want some figures? Okay, latest water test, tested the rain. 13,100 micrograms per liter of aluminum in the rain in 2013. Normally, it should be zero. So 13,100 is pretty damn much, folks. It used to be zero, then it was 100s in the 2000s, and then in, uh, since 2010, it's into the 1,000s and the latest 13,100. In the snow on Mount Shasta, pristine Mount Shasta, 61,000 micrograms per liter, four times the amount that is found in the soil up there. Where in the hell is this stuff coming from if it's not coming from the soil? We have clouds in the sky we've never seen before. Almost every day I'm seeing clouds I've never seen before. And NASA has been even named a few of these new clouds. Uh, and it's, it's really interesting, but NASA is a corporation. I want you to know that. Uh, NASA has also uh, conducted a research program in what they call metallized fuels. We're actually putting aluminum oxide right in the fuel because it has two atoms of aluminum and three atoms of oxygen. So during the combustion process, it releases all that oxygen and dramatically increases efficiency, but it leaves the aluminum in the air. We got things coming from sky down, and it's a huge, huge problem. Because as it comes down, what happens is a couple of things. Is that it actually is in our air, we breathe it. And as we breathe it, it's actually going to go up through our nostrils, into our brain, easiest access to our brain frontal lobe. The contaminants that are in, that have been identified, which already have been mentioned, are aluminum. Aluminum is the number one neural uh, free radical generator to the brain to cause early apoptosis, which is early death of brain and it begins to set off the scar tissue, which we call the amygdalin, which is, a pot, which is part of the um, chemical matrix related to Alzheimer's. I'm a neurologist practicing in Reading for 17 years, and in the past five years, I've seen the number of patients with Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, and other neurodegenerative diseases tremendously increase, almost quadruple. Uh, I became interested in chemtrails about eight years ago when I was in Hawaii, and the Hawaiians are really being very vocal about it. I concur about the increase in number of Alzheimer's. They have been able to take the aluminum and micronize it, which means it'll stay up longer. But it also means, and I don't know if any of you have noticed some metallic taste in your mouth when they're spraying, but you inhale that, it goes up through your cribriform plate and into your, through your sinuses and into the brain. As you heard, to spray nanoparticles, very small particles, these nanoparticles, they basically trigger a programmed cell death in the brain. And that is the ultimate pass we see in Alzheimer's. That's problem number one, because when we look at the Alzheimer issue, we say those are the old. The real problem is, and the real scare I have, is as I am a father of two, I am a grandfather of three, so the drama is, is our children. ADD started in the 70s. Autism was not on the radar. There was no documents, there was no information. It was one in 100,000 children. Today, what we have is one in 48 boys. I was part of the early group that was looking for aluminum in ADD and ADHD. And all of those children that started to develop those phenomena had high levels of aluminum. When we figured out protocols to detox them out, to free the body of those particular contaminants, what happened is that their brains came back. When we do this to the age, it doesn't come back as quick, but it will come back. But I'm seeing Alzheimer's in 56 years old. Back in the 70s, Alzheimer's when you were 80. If you remember eight to 10 years ago, there was this big move to get rid of aluminum from underarm deodorant is what calls Alzheimer's. <laughs> Look what they're doing to us now. I want to give you a little bit of history on the background behind nanoparticles has been described before. A nanometer is one billionth of a meter. It's very small. In fact, if you have particles, say, that are 40 or 50 nanometers across, you can take and line 50 of them up next to a single red blood cell. These things are extremely tiny. They're pervasive. 
the collapse and decrease of agriculture is something I worry about even more than the previous info about autism and Alzheimer's. Believe me, I'm seriously concerned with what I'm watching. As a wildlife biologist, I've been watching the ecosystem collapse. When you lose all your stream organisms, when you have aluminum overload in your streams, you're killing your microbial bacteria, and you're disrupting the entire ecosystem. So it goes way beyond just a little bit of pollution. Um, how did Monsanto know to create aluminum-resistant plants? I don't think I've heard anybody ask that question. Okay. Insects. I've done studies in Siskiyou County. They're at 20% of normal. The aquatic insects basically made a nosedive in 2006 to about 20% of normal. So far this year, I've sampled 200 trout stomachs. 98% of them are empty. So uh, sorry about the trout fishing fellows. The mayflies, stoneflies, dipteris, and caddisflies are uh, damn near gone. The terrestrial sampling is down to about 20% of normal, except for pest species like ants. Uh, we're seeing a loss of the major bird species, and as the gentleman said, the ecosystem is unraveling, and Audubon's been telling you that for years. The materials that are going into the environment right now, aluminum oxide nanoparticles and barium nanoparticles, these just happen to be the same materials that they use in nanothermate explosives. And so when this stuff settles down out of the air into the environment, it is small enough to be absorbed through the root structure of the trees and the forest. And so when there's a forest fire, and there will be a forest fire, those fires burn dramatically hotter. The point is that the, the, the cost of firefighting, the cost in the, in the healthcare system have nearly doubled in the last 10 years. The amount of acreage is lost because of fires. The impact on human health is dramatic. I personally tested uh, water and aluminum and I found aluminum had 47 times the normal expected amounts. Uh, strontium had 10 to 20 times the amounts. Barium was 20 times. This is what the stuff looks like here. I collected it. Looks, most people just think it's a cobweb, but I tested it. It has outrageous amounts of barium, strontium, and aluminum, but they destroy the sample, so I'm not letting this get away from me. You know, these tests are international in scope. We're seeing this all over the world, guys. Okay, pH of acid soils is 20 times more alkaline. The aluminum in the soil has doubled in the last 10 years. The rain normal was 5.6, it's 20 times more alkaline. Aluminum blocks essential nutrients. I am unable in my garden to restore normal pH, and that's because nanoparticles are now in the circulatory systems of both plants and humans. The Air Force conducted a study starting in 1993. It was called In Vitro Toxicity of Aluminum Nanoparticles in Rat alveolar macrophages. That's a real fancy way of saying testing the effect of aluminum nanoparticles on the white blood cells in the little air sacs in your lung, the alveoli. And what they found in this eight-year study was that these particles, when you're exposed to them long enough, it suppresses the ability of your white blood cells to defend you from airborne infections coming into your lungs. So it suppresses your immune system. But they also found that these same particles, once they get into your system, they can actually go through the barrier in each one of the cells. They get inside the cells, and these particles can actually suppress the ability of mitochondria which are in the cells that help to gobble up toxins and things that would be harmful to the nucleus and the, the reproduction process of the cells in your body. These processes are suppressed, and so essentially by breathing this material in, your immune system is dramatically suppressed. I wrote to the federal government because Air Force wrote a book, and on the first page of the book they say, we're going to control the weather by the year 2025. I asked them, what are they doing spraying this, these chemicals on the public? I said, there's violation of United States Code 50 U.S.C. 1520, which prohibits the American government from experimenting on the U.S. citizens with chemical agents. I said that law also requires the who's ever experimenting when the federal government does it, that they have to report to Congress within 30 days. They wrote back, they said they don't know what I'm talking about. We have enough evidence that there's a spraying going all, all over the place. Um, we were warned about the takeover of our freedoms by the military industrial complex by both Eisenhower and Kennedy. They're gaining traction on us, folks. We're, we are in trouble more than just a spraying program. All I can say is it's about time we get up in arms about this 
because it is affecting our health. It's high time that we as citizens of this great country take action. Board of Supervisors in Suffolk County, New York, they outlawed geochemical engineering. Hawaii passed an ordinance prohibiting geochemical engineering. I urge you to bar geoengineering in Shasta County and pass an ordinance. At least ask some damn questions. What the hell is all this aluminum doing here? Why are the trees dying? Fish is dying? Why is there Alzheimer and aluminum spiking? And why are these fibers on the ground here in Shasta County? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Marmon. Today, the Shasta County Board of Supervisors has been the beneficiary of some sincere, passionate, and knowledgeable comments. And I thank you for those. I am in agreement with my colleagues about sending letters and a call for action, but I would hope that we could go a step further. I would like for us to send a copy of this video where all of you spoke today, all two and a half or three hours of this testimony will be sent to our senators and our U.S. representatives we'll and, also, and also our representatives in the state of California. We'll do that. Let them listen to the passion that came out of this meeting today. Thank you. You have uh, the motion in front of you. I think it's understood. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Motion passes unanimously. The death dumps, otherwise known as chemical trails, are being dropped and sprayed throughout the United States, in England, Scotland, Ireland, Northern Europe, and I have personally seen them not only in the United States but in Mexico and Canada. Birds are dying around the world. Fish are dying by the hundreds of thousands around the world. This is genocide. This is poison. This is murder by the United Nations. This element within our society that's doing this must be stopped. I happen to know of two of the locations where the airplanes are that dump this crap on us. Four of the planes are out of Air National Guard, Lincoln, Nebraska, and the other planes are out of Fort Still, Oklahoma. I personally have observed the planes that were standing still in Nebraska, Lincoln, Nebraska, at the Air National Guard. They have no markings on them. They're huge bomber-like airplanes with no markings. This is a crime, a crime against humanity, a crime against America, a crime against the citizens of this great country. They must be stopped. What is wrong with Congress? This has an effect on their population and their people and their friends and their relatives and themselves. What's wrong with them? What's wrong with the pilots who are flying these airplanes? They're dumping this crap, this poison, on their own families. Somebody has to do something about it. Somebody in Congress has to step forward and stop it now. But thank you, I'm Ted Gunderson. Narodna skupština i vlada Srbije su posljednjim događajima oko namere legalizacije uzgoja genetski modifikovanih organizama pokazali da se moraju staviti pod javni nadzor i kontrolu, jer su izdali nacionalne interese naroda Srbije. Oni se ne smeju igrati sa državom i našim životima, ma ko to od njih tražio. Legalizacija uzgoja genetski izmenjenih organizama u Srbiji značila bi pored toga i otvaranje naših granica za uvoz takve hrane i proizvoda. Uvozom takvih opasnih namirnica započeo bi najmasovniji genocid stavništva Srbije. Tom polu svetu na vlasti i to je bilo malo ili im se jako žuri, pa su smislili novu tehnikom kojom su počeli da nas tretiraju kao insekte. Pogledajte naše nebo građani Srbije, jer se i sami možete uveriti. Pogledajte tragove otrova kojim nas neobeleženi avioni svakodnevno zasipaju. 
od trenutka kada je naša odnarodjena vlada potpisala sporazum o takozvanom partnerstvu za mir, nebo nad Srbijom premrzeli su tragovi otrova kojim nas ti neobeleženi zločinački avioni svakodnevno iz vazduha zasipaju kao da smo insekti, a ne ljudi. Nad nama se sprovodi vivo eksperimenti kao u koncu logorima tokom drugog svetskog rata. Nad nama se otvoreno vrši genocid. Naša izdajnička vlada je to dozvolila. Prodala je sobstveni narod da bi opstali na položaju gde su ih doveli predstavnici zločinačkih stranih agentura. Da li imate pravo da čutite? Da li možete da čutite dok vas i vašu decu zaprašuju otrojima za koje niko iz odnarođene vlade ne može da vam kaže kakvi nas to otrojima zasipaju? Da li možete da čutite kada znate da vas je ovaj izdajnički režim prodao i predao na milost i nemilost najvećoj zločinačkoj organizaciji na svetu? Ja, Nikola Aleksić, predstavnik ekološkog pokreta Novog Sada iz Srbije, jedine organizacije u Srbiji koja se zalaže i bori za zaštitu zdravlja i života stavoništva, neću i ne mogu da čutim. Javno zahtevam od Vojske Srbije da po ustavu počne da brani svoj narod i nebo iza Srbije, da obara ove neobeležene avioni i zločince koji sprovode genocid nad stanovništvom. Ako je Vojska Srbije 1991. godine imala izgovor za izdaju naroda i države, objašnjenjem da je bila partijska vojska, ja i danas otvoreno pitam, čija ste sada vojska kada dozvoljavate potpuno javno trovanje sobstvenog naroda za pršivanje sa neba iz neobeleženih aviona najveće zločinačke organizacije na svetu? Da li ste svesni posljedica vaše današnje izdaje? Da li mislite da vaša deca neće disati izbačene otrove? Da će vaša deca biti izuzeta od genocida? Vojnici, branite svoj narod i nebo iznad Srbije. Nemojte čekati komandu izdajničkog rukovodstva, jer kad oni budu izdali komandu, nas više neće biti. Vi ste se zaklali narodu Srbije, a ne stranačkim liderima koji gaze ustav Srbije i izdaju sobstveni narod. Ja... Nikola Aleksić, zahtevam od javnog tužioca Srbije da konačno počne da radi svoj posao ili ćemo ga smatrati sa očesnikom izdaje i trovanja sobstvenog naroda. On mora pokrenuti postupak protiv odgovornih lica zbog vele izdaje, makar to bio i sam predsjednik Republike Srbije. Neko nas je prodao zločincima, neko je prodao nebo na Srbio ovim zločincima da bi nas trovali. Neko je iz Srbije dao dozvolu ovim zločincima iz neobeleženih aviona za početak genocida nad stanovništom Srbije. Zločin genocida nikad ne zastareva. Ako ga ne pokrene javni tužilac danas, uveren sam da će ga narod pokrenuti sam, jer je dogorelo do nokata. Više se ne može i ne sme čutati. Srbija se mora probuditi ili je više neće biti. Srbija se nalazi pred umiranjem opljačkana, ponižena, ugrožene budućnosti, a povr svega sada su počeli da nam truju i prirodu, stavništvo i buduće generacije. Niko od nas ne zna kakve nas posljedice ovog zločinačkog zaprašivanja iz neobeleženih aviona u budućnosti mogu zadesiti. Niko od nas ne može da zna u kojoj generaciji može se ispoljiti planirani sterilitet naših potomaka, u kojoj generaciji nas mogu izbrisati sa geografske karte sveta. Ovo trovanje naroda se mora zaustaviti, ovako ili onako, da se ne bi desile fatalne posljedice. Sada je to već pitanje opstanka srpskog naroda. Zato poručujem Borisu Tadiću lično, ako ne zaustavite trovanje naroda iz neobeleženih aviona ili ako ne zaustavite uvoz hrane i semena od genetski modifikovanih organizama, ja, Nikola Aleksić, pozvaću građane Srbije da izađu na ulice. I prvi ću izaći, ne da rušimo sistem ili da palimo skupštinu, nego da branimo ustav, važeće zakone i pravo na svoju budućnost. Rađani Srbije, pozivam vas da branimo svim raspoloživim sredstvima svoje prirodno i ustavno pravo na zdravlje i živote, svoje neprikosnoveno pravo na budućnost i budućnost dece svoje dece, da branimo svoje prirodne i ustavno pravo na opstanak, O vremenu i trenutku izlaska na ulice blagovremeno ću vas javno obavesiti. Budite uvereni, ja, Nikola Aleksis, održat ću svoju reč makar po cenu sobstvenog života. Kajđov Hovando njeli masto, kumo va kajmen čikak kara 300 metoru hodom takasama de atte. 
長さはおよそ100キロ以上もあったということですこうした形の雲が発生するのは気象学的にも珍しいということで札幌の気象台が現在この映像を分析してどのような気象条件で発生したのか調べています
plus euh, de Nord-Ouest. Et puis, euh, ce que je voulais vous montrer, c'est ceci, c'est assez exceptionnel. Ce sont en fait euh, euh, des nuages. On les voit très bien, euh, toute cette ligne. Alors, ce sont les navires, figurez-vous, avec la condensation. C'est un petit peu ce qui se passe euh, fréquemment par les avions. Là, ce sont les navires qui provoquent de la condensation. Et comme un, un anticyclone qui fait comme un couvercle, ça bloque euh, <rire> ces <rire> nuages. <rire> 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 <rire>